Sir Jack Brabham started out with little more than talent and self-belief. From the very first lap, it's an all-out battle. Brabham shot ahead, determined to keep the number 12 out in front. Brabham roared away to victory in a Brabham, of course. His average speed was also the fastest... He went on to become a hero and a legend as a three-time Grand Prix world champion. Jack Brabham, who gets the upper hand, streaking ahead for his third consecutive Grand Prix victory. Jack Brabham won, covering the 225 miles at an average of just under 90 miles an hour and is the first and only person ever to win the Formula One World Championship in a car bearing his own name. I'm standing, I'm standing now in the showroom of a car dealer at Greenacre in Sydney. And I suppose it's very much like any car dealer showroom, except for all these trophies behind me. He is a man who, in his time, created history. Now, he thinks he's coming here tonight for a sporting interview with his son, and it's right here that I'm going to surprise them. Jack was like any boy of his age, obsessed with billy cards. You can either have a steering wheel or you can have a rope. Then what wheels you got, well, that was up to the gods. What do you say, Noah? It's a great race and the, and the best man did win. He left school at 15 to work as an apprentice at an engineer shop. We had to get bits and pieces and improvise with them, cut and shut and weld and do all sorts of things. Yeah, he was from an age when you had a wide variety of skills. The kind of industrial equivalent of the hunter-gatherer. You could see there's no doubt he's very earnest. He was going to be a good engineer. Good boy. Even away in the little-known interior, amongst the primitive natives, there are townships where agents of Hitler wait and plan for the downfall of a country that has sheltered them and given them security. The war interrupted Jack's sleepy existence, tinkering with bikes and cars. Every young man of fighting age finally had a reason for adventure. The cause of liberty and freedom. War had started, of course, when he was a teenager. Jack entered the RAAF midway through the war. But Jack had missed out on becoming a hero on the front line. The pick of Australia's manhood. He was part of a generation of young men who needed some kind of arena to prove themselves as worthy as the heroes who had returned home victorious in combat. Here he is, isn't it? You know what this reminds me of? A theater. An empty theater right now. But it has its audience, its cast drama, comedy, and sometimes it's tragedy, too. The spectacle here is a moving play on an asphalt stage with all the props. Producers and directors in the wings, the music, extras, comedians, good guys and bad guys, and the stars. And it was on a road trip up north that a friend took Jack to his first ever speedway. What he would have seen was motorised chaos. There was no roll cages, seat belts. The helmets were made of cork. A lot of blokes didn't even bother using goggles. The driver died of severe head injuries. Oh, Jack. Yes, the first time I met him was uh, in 48. He uh, was only a kid then, and he came up with a speedway car. Can you imagine driving down a dirt road and then having to turn left into the corner without hitting the brakes, but with your foot flat to the floor at the same time? Well, this is what speedway drivers did. I mean, all you can see now of a racing driver is a little bit at the top of their head, you know, they're sort of slightly bobbing around. In speedway, it's mechanicised warfare of the most purest kind. It's, it's wild, it's big. And that was my biggest surprise on the first night, was every other motor car was throwing dirt in my face. <laughs> in the very early 1950s, Jack took his Speedway racing car to a local hill climb. In his little titchy, self-built um, Speedway car, he blew them all into the weeds. Captain Benz at high speed called for steel wrists and iron nerve. Sport is, is somewhere where drive, dedication, bravery, that's what we celebrate. It's a great cause for the spectators too. You know, someone who's fucking brilliant at what they do, and we can cheer them on. The organisers actually disqualified his car because it wasn't fitted with front wheel brakes. Hold everything, he's going over. 
<laughs> and therefore didn't qualify for their purposes. Not this time. So Jack responded typically by fitting front wheel brakes, taking it back there and doing it again. Ron Turanak was racing Rolt open wheelers, which he'd built with his brother in their parents' garage. It was clear they saw something in each other, kindred spirits. Well, he was a, a very good friend of mine and uh, we got on very well. I've never been a very social person either, but I needed someone to train me. Ron and Jack were in some ways two peas in a pod. Neither of them talked much, but they could just look at what each other were doing and say, wow. Ron designed the cars and Dad tested them. It was an incredible partnership. Jack had his two-litre Kiva Bristol. And he fitted a bigger engine to give it more oomph. And he ended up corresponding with John and Charles Cooper of the Cooper Car Company. By the end of 1954, Jack had experienced everything Speedway and Hill Climb had to offer. And while he may not yet have had his sights set on challenging the European legends of motorsport, the hobbyist from Hurstville knew he'd be foolish if he didn't pursue his clear talent behind the wheel. And Jack realised that to progress in the motor racing world, he really needed to be in Britain. When he hears the booming tones of Big Ben, no English-speaking visitor feels a real stranger in London. The chimes from Westminster penetrate to the four corners of the globe, and Big Ben has become everyone's town clock. When Jack first came to the UK in 1955, he kissed his wife goodbye and his child goodbye. I think my dad ended up sacrificing quite a lot, particularly, I think, from a family point of view. He went over on his own and left his family behind for a, a year at a time, but I would never do that. And found himself surrounded by really a fast developing hotbed of motor racing development. We as loyal citizens must also do our part. British motor racing had been nowhere before the war. Silence. Conditions were so bad that there were worse shortages here than there ever had been at any time. And a number of people just got so fed up with this turgid, grey, post-war Britain that effectively they said, oh, to hell with it, let's go motor racing and have some fun. <laughs> the British manner of going motor racing was to start building racing cars, striving to surpass the dominant Ferrari and Maserati. En route to England, Jack made the pilgrimage to Ferrari. He was met with not the least bit of interest. He knew he probably appeared to them like a chancer from down under, but the experience stung him deeply, and he loved overtaking Ferrari for the rest of his career. Have you heard from Jack lately, Tom? Yes, we've heard a couple of times. I rang him up after Silverstone, and uh, we get a letter occasionally. Then comes your first race at Goodwood. Did you come to an embarrassing halt three laps from the finish? What happened? I'm afraid I ran out of petrol. <laughs> but Jack was quickly progressing. In his first year in England, he secured a seat in the Bristol team at Le Mans, where 83 spectators were killed. I mean, when you look at sport, we're living vicariously through the sports stars we're following. We want to see a crash because we can go through the whole drama of the crash, but we're not going to die. Drivers sprint for their cars at the start of the army. Jack then took Betty to the follow-up sports car enduro in Northern Ireland. Sterling Moss in a Mercedes is one of the first away on the seven and a half mile Dundrod circuit. He'd only been in the UK for six months and he was already wheel to wheel with the immortals of racing. Todd in a triumph, Hanzio Mercedes, Hawthorne Jaguar. But it had been a tough race for Jack. At this spot, in a few ghastly seconds, two drivers lost their lives. He and his co-driver, Jim Mayers, had tossed a coin to see who would start. His co-driver won the toss and was incinerated within the first few laps. He was fantastic from the start. A little wild, but everyone could see that he had it. One of the greatest names in motor racing from England. This is your life has flown in John Cooper of the famous Cooper Cars. As John Cooper said to me, we didn't 
really employ Jack Brabham. He just appeared in the factory one day and became a fixture. He's a brilliant engineer, and uh, he could set a car up for a race. He'd just pitch in and get on with something. Is it true that Jack was also a practical joker? Oh, yeah. He could make you anything, from a pair of pliers to a guided missile. He's just a natural engineer. He looks at things and understands so quickly uh, what's wrong with them or what's right with them. She was one of the only F1 drivers that probably knew everything about the race car, from the chassis to the engine to the setting up. He knew all the parts. Well, Jack Brabham was a remarkable man. In a funny sort of way, Jack never looked like a racing driver. I mean, Sterling Moss looked like a racing driver. Jim Clark looked like a racing driver. But it was fairly obvious, fairly early on, that he was a gore. And it wasn't really until the Cooper Car Company picked him up that Jack's feet really hit the ground. This is a start-finish line, the beginning and the end. It doesn't make any difference whether it's painted on asphalt or drawn in dirt with a stick. It's become a symbol of our civilization. Sometimes I think that uh, a line is drawn, and then some people get off in a corner and figure out just what the hell they're going to do with it. The place is Europe, or it can be Canada, South Africa, the United States. But more than glamorous names and places, it is a state of mind, an expression of the ultimate in racing, the Formula One World Driving Championships, the Grand Prix. This is the top. There's a strong British contingent at the start of the Monaco Grand Prix. Monaco, very small circuit, and in the 50s, very big cars. Moss and Brooks in Van Walls, and Collins and Hawthorne in Ferraris. Jack turns up in this tiny, tiny Cooper. Here's Mike Hawthorne's Ferrari. They'd never heard of this guy, Jack Brabham, running third in the Monaco Grand Prix. Everyone expects a rip-roaring finish. The Australians' spectacular cornering gave the crowds a thrill. And he runs out of petrol. He pushes it all the way to the end and made a star out of the driver, Jack Brabham. He was so lethargic in so many different ways, and then he got into a racing car. Problem in complete command. Everybody was a standard at the Speedway style. Coopers in those days were world champions that uh, took on the might of these big teams. And my father and him just got on so well. One of his biggest assets, however, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, uh, his engineer. Ron Taranek. Lovely, 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 lovely guy. When I was building uh, racing cars in England, I would design the ultimate racing car and then backtrack it so that it would build something that was just good enough to beat the opposition. A lot of the modifications that Jack wanted made had been communicated to him by his pen pal back in Australia, the engineer Ron Toranak. Jack Brabham and Ron Toranak just were like that. Ron Toranak and Jack uh, made a formidable team. By remote control, effectively, from 12,000 miles away, Ron Toranak was having very sound engineering ideas that he was communicating to Jack. He would come up with some rough sketches. He'd airmail it over to Australia. Ron would have a look at it, be on the phone. He'd then do all the drawings. The drawings would then come back. John was finding some way of smuggling all these modifications past his dad without his dad noticing. That was the great thing and he'd make the rear suspension, all the, the, the gearbox and the mounting and everything. I mean, it was almost like a secret society with the two of them. Ron Toranak, I always recall as one of the most competitive race engineers I've ever met. It was very difficult to decide who was actually steering the ship because obviously Jack had very uh, firm views on how to set up a car and uh, they would spend endless amounts of time uh, debating this, or you could say even arguing about it. And it was that sort of cheerful in-house 
let's do this, let's try this. And the sheer enthusiasm for going racing that enabled Cooper to establish what became known as the rear engine revolution. My name is Sterling Moss and I drove all types of cars in all types of races. What is it that makes a man spend countless hours making toy racing cars? For the modeler is none other than Sterling Moss, possibly the world's greatest racing driver. The logical favourite of the 1959 season, Moss, no doubt had his eye on taking out the championship. But on his travels, Jack had taken a protege under his wing for Cooper. The young Bruce McLaren. For many years, motor racing has been a popular sport in New Zealand, attracting drivers with a taste for thrills and mechanics with a taste for tinkering. Jack was so impressed by young Bruce that effectively he became his mentor. Jack was the person who made things happen for Bruce and in 1959 he joined Jack to start racing regularly at Grand Prix level. The first race was Monaco. It was the crown jewel of the Grand Prix circuit and seen as a rite of passage for drivers. The Monaco Grand Prix is known as the race of a thousand corners. It's a very, very uh, difficult circuit. You know, 21 corners, 78 laps, constantly coming at you, so narrow. You were off before the starting flag even fell. And they're off. A hundred laps of a two-mile circuit through the Monte Carlo streets. A testing race for cars and drivers. With speed, you stop having to be conscious. You have to rely on instinct. Just watch Mossy's beautiful control as he takes a double bend. You are not driving at five tenths. You're driving at nine tenths and sometimes 10 tenths. Brabham is in second place now. Cooper finally had an engine that was as good as everyone else's. But the radiators were blowing hot air straight onto his feet. He was burning up, the pedals were red hot. He was scared to touch the brake. Sterling's Cooper Climax developed transmission trouble. And with Sterling gone, Jack drove faster than he ever had before. Last lap and ahead of Tony Brooks, Ferrari was Jack Brabham. Securing his first Grand Prix race win this was shaping up to be a promising season. On a perfect day, a great crowd at Aintree's for the British Grand Prix. All you would predict is that he would do the unpredictable. Jack Brabham was driving a Cooper Climax. He wasn't necessarily the fastest driver out there. I think everyone agreed Sterling Moss was that. Jack certainly was as competent as any driver out there. Sterling Moss, as always, went out flat out. Sterling Moss drove his BRM superbly. Jack started swinging the back out for no other reason than to even up the tyre wear. Brabham shot ahead, determined to keep the number 12 out in front. Sterling Moss battled into second place. Sterling Moss had to stop and change his tyres. A delay fatal to his winning chance. Jack kept going and managed to win the race. Jack Brabham won, covering the 225 miles at an average of just under 90 miles an hour. One of the most extraordinary things about Jack Brabham was how unselfish he could be. Jack, what a great sport you were. How that time in New Zealand, you lent me your spare back axle. He supported and mentored people who would likely become rivals. I've known Jack for a long time, and he's helped me, um, well, 100% in my racing. You win the Monaco and British Grand Prix. Moss wins the Portuguese and Italian. Tony Brooks takes the French and German. Jack was one of three people that could win the World Championship. There was just one race to go. And strangely, it was in America, where they'd never had a Grand Prix before, and really, it was a second-rate track. The US Grand Prix attracts the world's best auto racing drivers. It's December 12, 1959, when you line up on the grid. As always, Sterling Moss went flying out of the gate. The bumpy track was more than just a rumor. But he overcooked it. Yeah, this is something funny with the gearbox. In Australia's Jack Brabham and New Zealander Bruce McLaren in the lead. Jack led most of the race with Bruce McLaren tucked in behind him. The championship is in your grasp and then two corners from the end, it happens again, didn't it, Jack? He ran out of fuel. I ran out of petrol. <laughs> <laughs> He's 800 metres from the finish. You decide to finish by pushing your car uphill to the finishing line. Bruce was about to stop behind him and Jack said, no, get on with it, get on with it. If you win, I win the championship. You cross the line, surrounded by a police escort and screaming fans. Jack and the little Coopers had beaten Ferrari and Maserati and put them squarely in their place. First Australian to be world champion, the first man in a rear engine car to be world champion. He was a pretty happy boy. Now, 
Jack had well and truly arrived. He'd been anointed into the realm of champions, and 1960 was now a chance to further establish himself amongst the heroes of motorsport. Fangio and Ferrari, Moss and Farina. At the end of the day, to go fast, you need some serious gonads between your legs. Men like drama, don't they? You know, they love to do everything at its most risky. So they start the 1960 season with the 1959 car. Charlie Cooper, the old man, says, no, I don't want to spend money when we're winning. But Jack knew they'd have to innovate to stay ahead of Ferrari and Lotus. And he and John Cooper and Bruce McLaren all worked on this new car, the Cooper Lowline. Jack's instincts were right, with Bruce winning Argentina and Jack picking up a win at the Dutch Grand Prix. What are your thoughts when you're driving a fast car like this, Jack? Well, Vic, uh, it's very exciting driving a motor car like this. Empirically, what a car is, it's a vehicle with an engine and four wheels that carries passengers. But, of course, it's an incredibly potent symbol. A car isn't just this thing they drive around in, it is them. When the helmet does go on and you're in fighter pilot mode and man and machine on the limit going into combat, uh, you're very much at one with the car. Spa was a particularly difficult one. Sterling Moss and Jack Brabham number two. Ditches, barbed wire fences beside the track. Basically every hazard you could build into a racetrack was there at Spa. It's rare for anything to go wrong so early, but a triple crash came here. Two drivers die in the race. Brabham now faster than Moss. And the race kept going and Jack won. Brabham, however, roared away to victory in the second. Despite the tragedy, Jack kept his focus razor sharp for his next outing at Reims. From the very first lap, it's an all-out battle between the British and Italian machine. With the lead exchanging in impossibly tight slipstream battles. Brabham's Cooper and Phil Hill's Ferrari battled desperately to get... For men, the traffic is the last Serengeti. It's where they're in conflict with others, they're chasing, they're having to negotiate through the forest of the streets. You know, so all the kind of ancient primal instincts, you can play it out in a car. Jack Brabham, who gets the upper hand, streaking ahead for his third consecutive Grand Prix victory. And after Reims, Jack made it five in a row. Brabham's Cooper Climax well in front. With wins at the British and Portuguese Grand Prix. One more for an overcrowded mantelpiece. He'd done it. Back-to-back -back world championships. Moss, Hawthorne, Collins, Jack, you face an impressive roll call of racing greats. In 1961, he branched out. Ron Taranak joined him in England. He gave me a thousand pounds to moved the family to England and uh, for a year's trial. Although he'd won back-to-back -back world championships in Cooper cars, some rival car constructors were actually building more sophisticated cars with greater performance potential than Cooper really could shake a stick at. To design each year as perfect and advanced a piece of engineering as science can devise, I just was always concerned with what I was doing and uh, staying ahead of the total opposition. This is where we build our racing cars, and there are literally hundreds of component parts that go to building a racing car. It's a brutal comparison, but Cooper have been described as a bunch of blacksmiths meeting in Chapman and Lotus, a bunch of technologists. May your success continue, and good luck for 1961. Thank you, Vic. I've been up to Frisco for the sprints, out to Charlotte to see the stocks, into the Glen for the Grand Prix, Indy for the drag and for the big one. I paid $200 million to sit with 40 million fans. I've eaten 20 tons of hot dogs and drunk a Rose Bowl full of pop. I'm this year's spectator, Race Fan USA. 
When the balloons go up beside the track at Indianapolis, spectators know it's time for the start of the world's most chancy motor race. In 1961, at Indianapolis, Jack went there with his Formula One Cooper Climax, which absolutely outraged and upset the ultra-conservative American Speedway fraternity. Brabham, what is the nature of the fuel used? The Indy regulators came to watch the comically small car with its engine in the wrong spot. They had the engine in the back, which was completely anathema to them, but the second thing, it was painted green. And at Indianapolis, green cars were killer cars. Because they're a threat to my territory, to my very being. That is my shiny, you know, phallus that I'm driving along in. The big thrill wasn't long in coming. A six-car pilot. But within a couple of years, all Indy 500 cars were rear-engined. He showed that Formula One technology could work at Indianapolis. After Jack won the World Championship, he told me that he had an invite to go and see Mr. Ferrari, so he flew down to Italy and uh, was interviewed by Mr. Ferrari. And he said he had a, quite a good offer, but he went home and thought about it. He said, I turned it down, he said, because the only reason that Colin and Bruce and myself went racing was to beat Ferrari, and I couldn't possibly join them. Enzo Ferrari once told John Cooper that he'd never build a rear-engine race car, but in 61, he did, and it was a killer. During the heart of that season, Ferrari just ran riot with their V6 engine, sharp-nosed cars. Right, cue him. So I've flown back from Rome to bring you these special pictures direct from the racetrack at Monza. One of the few highlights was when Jack was leading at Monza. Congratulations, Phil. What sort of a race did you have? Peter, yeah, this was a real tough one. But as on so many occasions that season, he broke down. This Monza track has got some steep banking. It's got fast straights, hairpins, a lot. Then in the second lap, approaching the curve on the inner section of the road circuit, it happened. <laughs> von Tripp's Ferrari, after touching Clark's Lotus, had crashed through a fence and rebound. Wolfgang von Tripp's lay dead and death came to 13 spectators in this appalling crash. All right, Marjorie, sorry. Just give me a minute, I'll fix it. Jolly good. Let's go again, then. Do you think the combination of Bradham and Cooper is going to bring you the World Championship hat-trick this year? It was the Ferraris who triumphed once more. And after back-to-back -back championship wins, Jack had well and truly fallen back to earth. By the end of the 1961 season, Jack fully appreciated that many of the things that he wanted to do would be impossible against the increasing conservatism of Charlie Cooper. When I went to England, I worked for Jack's company during the normal working hours, and of a night, I spent the time designing our first Formula One car. They were building a Formula Junior car for a private customer. Which was really mine. I, I wasn't paid for that at all. I just drew it overnight. And the opportunity was there to go independent. <laughs> Surrounded by English countryside is the racing car factory of Jack Brabham. Well, I came over principally in the first place to go motor racing. And after motor racing for quite a few years, uh, the interest in the mechanical side of it has always been very great. And the obvious answer was to eventually build our own cars. A friend of theirs pointed out that the French pronunciation of MRD, merde, was very rude. In Fr French, M-R-D means mud, which is covered all over in shit. And said, you know, you have, you have the perfect name, the perfect marketing brand. No. Uh, why would it be Brabham Racing Developments when, it, when uh, I was designing the cars and responsible for the build of them? We should have had a, a neutral name or I should have been involved in it. I think in the end, I mean, both of them wanted to win and were doing whatever they thought was necessary to win. 
motor racing developments thereafter produced Brabham racing cars and Brabham racing cars became the thing to have for Formula 2 racing, Formula 3 racing and went on to the most tremendous customer success. Lynn, you're married to uh, Jackie Oliver who's a pretty quick man on the Grand Prix circuit. Do you ever talk about the danger at all? We don't really talk about it to our husbands because we know they're going to go on racing. We have to let a boy or a man do what they want to do. When wife next to me started screaming and yelling, and I sat there and I got scared, and I never was afraid before. The best thing one can do is make sure you're really well financially secure. I don't think it was easy for my mum. If I look back and think of the, the thing that really shaped her was the, the danger of Grand Prix racing in the 60s. She was very nervous. Because men are stupid enough to take risks. You know, men are addicted to risks. Betty was the most nervous person in the team. I mean, she was a nervous wreck, really. She was tough. <laughs> wow, is she tough. I don't know how she went and watched Jack every weekend. To go there and pretty much every weekend someone was going to die made them a different breed of people. They went to a lot of funerals, um, very good friends of theirs, uh, you know, from within the paddock, all the drivers. And I think that probably shaped her more, more than anything, was, was that fear of Jack going out there and not coming back again. But I think that's probably what was the bottom line, was that she now had three kids and, you know, the last thing you want to do is have her husband get wiped out in a race car. Thirteenth, Monarcha Grand Prix. They want you one day earlier this year, Mr. Brabham. Roger phoned, can he catch a lift? Seventeenth, you're due at Zonvoort. On the 25th, you present a Formula 3 car to the best pupil driver for BP in London. You'll have to make a speech, witty and not more than ten minutes, they say. The whole Brabham Formula One program was formalised when Dan Gurney joined in 1963. Still out in front, Dan the man Gurney. Early into the 1963 program, Jack's hopes of another championship were already looking unlikely. Behind number six, Jack Brabham. They would lead races and the engine would fail. The fuel trouble, five laps from the end. Very bad luck. The days of being single-mindedly focused on the track must have seemed like a luxury now to Jack. He had cars to build and payroll to meet. He was either at a race track or he was in his workshop. And he'd come home to eat, sleep, and off he'd go again. He was racing against, you know, the Jimmy Clarks, the Sterling Mosses. But unlike them, he had other business ventures going on as well. He was also being outclassed in the field by Dan Gurney. Dan Gurney, driving a Brabham Climax, number nine, was on his tail until engine trouble. By the end of 1963, Dan was starting to sense that Jack didn't want to spend the money needed to compete with the likes of Lotus and Ferrari. Jim Clark wins at over 107 miles an hour. Jack Brabham, he was very tight with money. Because his interest was in the, the cost of the cars and maintenance. They'd work long hours, late nights and early mornings. Here, Jack has gathered a team of experts to bring a car first over the finishing line. Finally, it all came together at the French Grand Prix. Jim Clark and Dan Gurney in hot pursuit. Gurney had bagged a win for Brabham Racing. And that was the Brabham Marks, first World Championship qualifying Grand Prix success. But Jack still couldn't break his drought. Jack Brabham, racing ace and designer too, in a Brabham, of course. It had been four years since he had won an F1 race, and the aura around him as a champion was quickly fading. In the third lap, Dan Gurney was in real trouble. Gurney's patience was wearing thin, with Jack's reluctance to spend money. He'd just broken the lap record when he had to drive into the pits with his transistor ignition on fire. Things with Ron were also starting to fall apart. All the journalists believed that he was responsible for the design and build of the cars which was my responsibility, actually. Gurney bagged a win at the season-ending Mexico Grand Prix, but it seemed too little too late. Hello, I'm Jack Brabham. Dan was now the only one winning anything, and no one seemed to be celebrating his achievements. 
They didn't celebrate at all, never. They really were like a bunch of Trappist monks. I never saw Jack up to you really let his hair down at any time. He wasn't really that sort of bloke. He probably just went away quietly and counted his money and took it to Switzerland. And... <laughs> flew to Monaco with Jack in 1968. We flew to Nice via Geneva, and Jack just disappeared for a couple of hours. So I reckon he'd been to the bank, put it like that. Mean everybody cheats in Formula One. Did you ever cheat? Uh, you never caught. It's only wrong if you get caught. That's Jack, what Jack's saying, yeah. It's only wrong if you get caught. Did Bradley ever cheat? Never caught. <laughs> It's the wrong word is cheat. I mean, people do whatever they can to get an advantage. That's the only way you will achieve maximum results. If you're really running on the edge of the rules. And on the track, boy, did blackjack the most competitive of all Australian sports from mean business. Yet such was the skill level of them all in those days that Blackjack was involved in very, very few accidents. Some will tell us that he just used to cause them. Because another thing you've got to appreciate was that Blackjack, or Blackie, could be as mean as Ratchet. I've had more marks on my crash helmet from Jack Brabham than I have in any accident. If it came to elbows out driving, Jack was the man. He knew exactly when to just go off the racetrack a tiny bit. Rivals retired their cars with holes through the radiator. And there was always stones and gravel, which... He winked at me when he told me that. He said, uh, you know what I used to do, don't you, Tony? I don't believe it, even if it's true. the chequered flag down across your bonnet and no cars ahead of you. That's the best sight in the world to a racing driver. What's glorious about sport is that it's ritualized war. Jack was desperately looking for solutions to get back on top for 1965. Yeah, we still want that gritty, reckless, stoic hero because then that he's kind of carrying with him that bit in us that we wish we could be like that. Jack didn't particularly like the Coventry Climax V8 engine to which they were wedded. So he turned his attention to Formula 2 and enlisted Honda. Well, H Honda had sent an engine over for Formula 2 with four young engineers. Everything was started from zero. So we have to learn everything. The Brabham Honda outing was yet another failure. Uh, they, they run the engine up for us, but it was no good for a race car because we didn't have that many revs available. He irritated so much. And 1965 was another one of those years with not a single win for the team. Dan was very much like my dad. You know, he wanted to uh, start his own team. Gurney finally left at the end of the season to start his own team, and Jack's old protege, Bruce McLaren, did the same, leaving Cooper to start his own team. Fangio was 47 when he retired with five Grand Prix World titles behind him. Have you any set retirement plans? I think there must have been some comments in the press about the age of Jack as a driver. You are 40 now, and I suppose you must have given some thought to how long you can keep going and stay at the front. And his wife, Betty, used that as an argument to stop racing and have more influence on the children and get back to Australia. Didn't seem to bother him. He wanted to race. And that was it. I haven't got any different plans, but uh, I certainly don't intend retiring at the moment. Well, well, yeah, I think mythologizing. I mean, I think we all, we all, we are human beings. We love a story. You know, that's what that's central to how we construct ourselves is narrative. 
It's the most powerful and most ancient form of culture. And so you need heroes. You've got to have them. And if Jack could beat out Gurney and McLaren in the following season and become the first driver to win a championship in a car bearing his own name, he knew he'd not only become a hero again, he'd become a legend. Before 1966 and the new three-litre formula, Coventry Climax announced that they would not be building a suitable engine. So we had to produce a Formula One car in a hurry. And few people were willing to supply them because they'd be making a rod for their own backs. Jack was racing in America and he heard about these. He saw opportunity in 1966, I guess, that wasn't obvious to anybody else. The new engine that he chose was an American prototype production V8. He told Repco about them. Repco agreed to support Jack. Phil Irving was charged with drawing the Repco Brabham race engine. Drivers and teams were delighted because they thought it would be not very competitive. No Formula One engine had ever been built in Australia. Who would have gone to Australia to get a motor racing engine for Formula One? Betty cooked me a steak for lunch at home with Jack and we shook hands on a deal. And the idea was I was going to work on the Repco engines. And Ron Toronac engineered that into BT19 and BT20 cars. There was no test bed, so they would just get put in the cars, and uh, Jack and Danny had to drive them a bit slowly for the first few laps. They were very practical. The Repco engine was constantly failing. And they had all the reliability. One particular practice we went to, one of the valve seats fell out. And this Australian developed engine was regarded initially as a very much the underdog in Formula One competition. That they've only got literally one engine. It breaks down in its first race. It breaks down in its second race. There was a moment there before we went to Reims where Jack, he said, do you think we should carry on with this thing? You had my dad, Bruce McLaren, and Dan Gurney all building their own cars, taking on the might of Lotus and, and Ferrari. Jack Brabham approving the Brabham Repco. We both said, no, no, we've, we've got to keep going. Jack Brabham's car is proving to be greater than anticipated. It beats the Ferraris. It was victory for Brabham. His average speed was also the fastest ever set. Hang on, this engine that no one is taking seriously, it has beaten the Ferraris. It's also the first time that a driver has ever won a world title event in a car of his own construction. And all of a sudden we were King Kong and away we went. Jack Brabham driving a Repco Brabham. And they just won race after race after race, driven by Jack Brabham and by Denny Holm. Well, I didn't think about it. We just carried on with the next one. The fastest European race since the war. A very proud moment in all of our lives. They were very, very competent people, producing beautifully well-made machines. Jack has won three races in a row, with an engine people were laughing at at the start of the year. If that's not enough, he's got a Honda engine in his Formula 2 car. Jack Brabham, powered by a Japanese Honda engine. He's worked really closely with them, and suddenly they have a world beater. <laughs> Jack Brabham and his teammate are 1-2 in the overall point standing. So after all those dark years, they are so close to winning the championship. Jack Brabham in his red coat, Brabham number three. The Australian won the driver's world title in 59 and 60. Nürburgring is known as the Green Hell. The German Grand Prix, 14 miles of ups and downs over the grueling Nürburgring. Most difficult, most challenging, most prestigious, most historic racetrack in the world. You can go off into the forest and they're not going to find you for weeks. And it's raining. It is extremely dangerous. Fastest lap in practice, number one, world champion Jim Clark. This was the biggest race of Jack's life. The win at Nürburgring, guaranteeing motorsport immortality. 
No sooner has a race started than there's tragedy. Jackie X and John Taylor collide. So we have a car on fire. John Taylor, he's in a Brabham car. Brabham still leading, driving a Repco Brabham. It was an era where drivers would drive straight past a burning car where someone literally was being immolated. There was an accident, they drove harder because they knew others would be backing off. On Brabham's tail, John Setti's Cooper Maserati number seven. Most teams would have collapsed during that long season of lack of success. The Australian won the Drivers' World title in 59 and 60. And they are a hair's breadth away from winning the World Championship, which would make Jack a three-time World Champion. Brabham on his way to victory. Jack Brabham, ex-world champ, proves he's not too old at 40 by this superbly confident win. And for the very first time in motor racing history, we had a world champion driver who'd won the world championship in a car bearing his own name. Brabham Racing went on to win the Constructors' Championship for a second time in 1967, with the Drivers' Championship going to Jack's teammate, Danny Holm. And in 1978, Jack became the first ever racing driver to be honoured with a knighthood for his services to motorsport. Jack retired from Formula One in 1970, and in the following year, the Brabham Racing team was sold to Bernie Eccleston. I said I'd buy into the team. Under Bernie, the Brabham Racing team achieved another eight years of unprecedented Grand Prix success. When Bernie sold it, things you know, went downhill really fast from that point to where it just totally disappeared. A state funeral for a three-time world champion. Motor racing great Sir Jack Brabham has been remembered as a legend on and off the track at his state funeral today. His life could have come straight from the pages of the boys' own adventure books of his day. Jack passed away on Monday morning, May the 19th, in their home here on the Gold Coast. He was 88 years of age. I think as I got older, you start to understand more about what Jack actually achieved. And it's so big, so vast. My attitude was, well, I'll never get that far, but how far could I get? In 2013, after a lengthy legal battle in the German courts, David Brabham won back the rights to the family name and vowed to continue the legacy that Jack had begun. Global reveal of the Brabham 1862. Tonight we're welcoming back one of the great names in motor racing, the continuation of the epic history of a story that began with the young Jack Brabham racing that midget car out there in the corner. And the more victory for David and for Jeff help keep the Brabham name in the forefront. We've done what my father did back in 1948, backed ourselves and got it done, and develop a car that absolutely has the right to carry the Brabham name into the future. The new BT62 supercar took the lap record at Phillip Island and wowed the racing world at Portimao in Portugal. And in 2019, set a sensational lap record time at Mount Panorama in Bathurst. Brabham have announced their intention to compete in 2021 at the gruelling 24 Hours of Le Mans, honouring Sir Jack's accomplishments with a new era of unprecedented record-breaking victories. Success is only a matter of time.